Good evening. Tonight, for Tales and Cocktails, I have decided to choose another of the short stories of Somerset Maugham. Now, I've already read for you The Verger, A String of Beads, The Facts of Life, The Promise, and The Happy Couple. But he was such a prolific writer and such a very, very popular writer that I really feel we can't get enough of him. <clears throat> Excuse me. So tonight's story is entitled Before the Party. Mrs. Skinner liked to be in good time. She was already dressed in black silk as befitted her age and the mourning she wore for her son-in-law and now she put on her toque. She was a little uncertain about it since the feathers which adorned it might very well arouse in some of the friends she would certainly meet at the party acid expostulations and of course it was shocking to kill these beautiful birds, these beautiful white birds in their mating season too for the sake of their feathers. But there they were, so pretty and stylish. And it would have been silly to refuse them, and it would have hurt her son-in-law's feelings. He had brought them all the way from Borneo, and he expected her to be so pleased with them. Kathleen had made herself rather unpleasant about them. She must wish she hadn't now, after what had happened. She but Kathleen had never really liked Harold. Mrs. Skinner, standing at her dressing table, placed the toque on her head. It was, after all, the only nice hat she had. And put a pin, put in a pin with a large jet knob. If anyone spoke to her about the, the Ospreys, she had her answer. I know it's dreadful, she would say, and I wouldn't dream of buying them. But my poor son-in-law bought them. He brought them back the last time he was home on leave. That would explain her possession of them and excuse their use. Everyone had been very kind. Mrs. Skinner took a clean handkerchief from a drawer and sprinkled a little eau de cologne on it. She never used scent and she had always thought it rather fast but eau de cologne was so refreshing. She was very nearly ready now, and her eyes wandered out of the window beyond, behind her looking glass. Canon Haywood had a beautiful day for his garden party. It was warm and the sky was blue. The trees had not yet lost the fresh green of the spring. She smiled as she saw her little granddaughter in the strip of garden behind the house busily raking her own flower bed. Mrs. Skinner wished Joan were not quite so pale. It was a mistake to have kept her so long in the tropics, and she was so grave for her age. You never saw her run about. She played quiet games of her own invention and watered her garden. Mrs. Skinner gave the front of her dress a final pat, took up her gloves, and went downstairs. Kathleen was at the writing table in the window, busy with lists she was making, for she was honorary secretary of the ladies' golf club, and when there were competitions, had a great deal to do. But she too was ready for the party. I see you've put on your jumper after all, said Mrs. Skinner. They had discussed at luncheon whether Kathleen should wear her jumper or her black chiffon. The jumper was black and white, and Kathleen thought it rather smart, but it was hardly mourning. Millicent, however, was in favor of it. There's no reason why we, shouldn't all, why we should all look as if we'd just come from a funeral, she said. Harold's been dead eight months. To Mrs. Skinner, it seemed rather unfeeling to talk like that. Millicent was strange since her return from Borneo. You're not going to leave off your weeds yet, darling, she asked. Millicent did not give a direct answer. 
People don't wear mourning in the way they used, she said. She paused a little, and when she went on, there was a tone in her voice which Mrs. Skinner thought quite peculiar. It was plain that Kathleen noticed it too, for she gave her sister a curious look. I'm sure Harold wouldn't wish me to wear mourning for him indefinitely. I dressed early because I wanted to say something to Millicent, said Kathleen in reply to her mother's observation. Oh? Kathleen did not explain. But she put her list aside and with knitted brows read for the second time a letter from a lady who complained that the committee had most unfairly marked down her handicap from 24 to 18. It requires a good deal of tact to be honorary secretary to a ladies' golf club. Mrs. Skinner began to put on her new gloves. The sun blinds kept the room cool and dark. She looked at the great wooden hornbill, gaily painted, which Harold had left in her safekeeping, and it seemed a little odd and barbaric to her, but he had set much store by it. It had some religious significance, and Canon Haywood had been greatly struck by it. On the wall over the sofa were melee weapons. She forgot what they were called, and here and there on occasional tables, pieces of silver and brass, which Harold at various times had sent to them. She had liked Harold, and involuntarily <clears throat> her eyes sought the photograph which stood on the piano with photographs of her two daughters, her grandchild, her sister, and her sister's son. Why, Kathleen, where's Harold's photograph? she asked. Kathleen looked round. It no longer stood in its place. Someone's taken it away, said Kathleen. Surprised and puzzled, she got up and went over to the piano. The photographs had been rearranged so that no gap would show. Perhaps Millicent wanted to have it in her bedroom, said Mrs. Skinner. I should have noticed it. Besides, Millicent has several photographs of Harold. She keeps them locked up. Mrs. Skinner had thought it very peculiar that her daughter should have no photographs of Harold in her room. Indeed, she had spoken of it once, but Millicent had made no reply. Millicent had been strangely silent since she came back from Borneo and had not encouraged the sympathy Mrs. Skinner would have been so willing to show her. She seemed unwilling to speak of her great loss. Sorrow took people in different ways. Her husband had said the best thing was to leave her alone. The thought of him turned her ideas to the party they were going to. Father asked if I thought he ought to wear a top hat, she said. I said I thought it would be just as well to be on the safe side. It was going to be quite a grand affair. They were having ices, strawberry and vanilla from Buddy, the confectioner, but the Haywoods were making the iced coffee at home. Everyone would be there. They had been asked to meet the Bishop of Hong Kong, who was staying with the canon, an old and law and an old college friend of his, and he was going to speak on the Chinese missions. Mrs. Skinner, whose daughter had lived in the East for eight years and whose son-in-law had been resident of a district in Borneo, was in a flutter of interest. Naturally, it meant more to her than to people who had never had anything to do with the colonies and that sort of thing. What can they know of England that only England knows, as Mr. Skinner said? He came into the room at that moment. He was a lawyer, as his father had been before him, and he had offices in Lincoln's Inn Fields. He went up to London every morning and came down every evening. He was only able to accompany his wife and daughters to the canon's garden party because the canon had very wisely chosen a Saturday to have it on. Mr. Skinner looked very well in his tailcoat and pepper and salt trousers. He was not exactly dressy, 
but he was neat. He looked like a respectable family solicitor, which indeed he was. His firm never touched work that was not perfectly above board. And if a client went to him with some trouble that was not quite nice, Mr. Skinner would look grave. I don't think this is the sort of case that we very much care to undertake, he said. I think you'd do better to go elsewhere. He drew towards him his writing block and scribbled a name and address on it. He tore off a sheet of paper and handed it to his client. If I were you, I think I would go and see these people. If you mention my name, I believe they'll do anything they can for you. Mr. Skinner was clean shaven and very bald. His pale lips were tight and thin, but his blue eyes were shy. He had no color in his cheeks, and his face was much lined. I see you've put on your new trousers, said Mrs. Skinner. I thought it would be a good opportunity, he answered. I was wondering if I should wear a buttonhole. I wouldn't, father, said Kathleen. I don't think it's awfully good form. Only clerks, but a lot of people will be wearing them, said Mrs. Skinner. Only clerks and people like that, said Kathleen. The Haywoods have had to ask everybody, you know. And besides, we are in mourning. I wonder if there'll be a collection after the bishop's address, said Mr. Skinner. I should hardly think so, said Mrs. Skinner. I think it would be rather bad form, said Kathleen. It's as well to be on the safe side, said Mr. Skinner. I'll give for all of us. I was wondering if 10 shillings would be enough or if I must give a pound. If you give anything, I think you ought to give a pound, Father, said Kathleen. I'll see you when the time comes. I don't want to give less than anyone else, but on the other hand, I see no reason to give more than I need. Kathleen put away her papers in the drawer of the writing table and stood up. She looked at her rich wa wrist watch. Is Millicent ready? asked Mrs. Skinner. There's plenty of time. We're only asked at four, and I don't think we ought to arrive much before half past. I told Davis to bring the car around at 4.15. Generally, Kathleen drove the car. But on grand occasions like this, Davis, who was the gardener, put on his uniform and acted as chauffeur. It looked better when you drove up, and naturally Kathleen didn't much want to drive herself when she was wearing her new jumper. The sight of her mother forcing her fingers one by one into her new gloves reminded her that she must put on her own. She smelled them to see if any color any odor of the cleaning still clung to them. It was very slight. She didn't believe anyone would notice. At last the door opened and Millicent came in. She wore her widow's weeds. Mrs. Skinner never could get used to them, but of course she knew that Millicent must wear them for a year. It was a pity they didn't suit her. They suited some people. She had tried on Millicent's bonnet once with its white band and long vein, veil and thought she looked very well in it. Of course, she hoped dear Alfred would survive her, but if he didn't, she would never go out of weeds. Queen Victoria never had. It was different for Millicent. Millicent was a much younger woman. She was only 36. It was very sad to be a win widow at 36, and there wasn't much chance of her marrying again. Kathleen wasn't very likely to marry now. She was 35. Last time Millicent and Harold had come home, she had suggested that they should have Kathleen to stay with them. Harold had seemed willingly enough, but Millicent said it wouldn't do. Mrs. Skinner didn't know why not. It would give her a chance. Of course, they didn't want to get rid of her, but a girl ought to marry 
And somehow all the men they knew at home were married already. Millicent said the climate was trying. It was true she had a bad color. No one would think now that Millicent had been the prettier of the two. Kathleen had fined down as she grew older. Of course, some people said she was too thin. But now that she had cut her hair with her cheeks red from playing golf in all weathers, Mrs. Skinner thought her quite pretty. No one could say that of poor Millicent. She had lost her figure completely. She had never been tall, and now that she had filled out, she looked stocky. She was a good deal too fat. Mrs. Skinner supposed it was due to the tropical heat that prevented her from taking exercise. Her skin was sallow and muddy, and her blue eyes, which had been her best feature, had gone quite pale. She ought to do something about her neck, Mrs. Skinner reflected. She's becoming dreadfully jowly. She had spoken of it once or twice to her husband. He remarked that Millicent wasn't as young as she was. That might be, but she needn't let herself go altogether. Mrs. Skinner made up her mind to talk to her daughter seriously. But of course she must respect her grief, and she would wait till the year was up. She was just as glad to have this reason to put off a conversation, the thought of which made her slightly nervous. For Millicent had certainly changed. There was something sullen in her face, which made her mother not quite at home with her. Mrs. Skinner liked to say aloud all the thoughts that passed through her head. But Millicent, when you made a remark just to say something, you know, had an awkward habit of not answering, so that you wondered whether she had heard. Sometimes Mrs. Skinner found it so irritating that not to be quite shocked with Millicent, she had to remind herself that poor Harold had only been dead eight months. The light from the window fell on the widow's heavy face as she advanced silently, but Kathleen stood with her back to it, she watched her sister for a moment. Millicent, there's something I want to say to you, she said. I was playing golf with Gladys Haywood this morning. Did you beat her? asked Millicent. Gladys Haywood was the canon's only unmarried daughter. She told me something about you, which I think you ought to know. Millicent's eyes passed beyond her sister to the little girl watering flowers in the garden. Have you told Annie to give Joan her tea in the kitchen, Mother? She said. Yes, she'll have it when the servants have theirs. Kathleen looked at her sister coolly. The bishop spent two or three days at Singapore on his way home, she went on. He's very fond of traveling. He's been to Borneo, and he knows a great many of the people that you know. He'll be interested to see you, dear, said Mrs. Skinner. Did he know poor Harold? Yes, he met him at Kuala Sarawar. He remembers him very well. He says he was shocked to hear of his death. Millicent sat down and began to put on her black gloves. It seemed strange to Mrs. Skinner that she received these remarks with complete silence. Oh, Millicent, she said, Harold's photo has disappeared. Have you taken it? Yes, I put it away. I should have thought you'd like to have it out. Once more, Millicent said nothing. It really was an exasperating habit. Kathleen turned slightly in order to face her sister. Millicent, why did you tell us that Harold died of fever? The widow made no gesture. She looked at Kathleen with steady eyes but her sallow skin darkened with a flush. She did not reply. What do you mean, Kathleen? asked Mr. Skinner with surprise. The bishop says that Harold committed suicide. Mrs. Skinner gave a startled cry, but her husband put out a deprecating, deprecating hand. Is it true, Millicent? 
Yes. Then why didn't you tell us? Millicent paused for an instant. She fingered idly a piece of Brunei brass which stood on the table by her side. That too had been a present from Harold. I thought it better for Joan that her father should be thought to have died of fever. I didn't want her to know anything about it. You've put us in an awfully awkward position, said Kathleen, frowning a little. Gladys Haywood said she thought it rather nasty of me not to have taught her, told her the truth. I had the greatest difficulty in getting her to believe that I knew absolutely nothing about it. She said her father was rather put out. He says after all the years we've known one another, and considering that he married you, and the terms we've been on and all that, he does think we might have had confidence in him. And at all events, if we didn't want to tell him the truth, we needn't have told him a lie. I must say I sympathize with him there, said Mr. Skinner acidly. Of course, I told Gladys that we weren't to blame. We only told them what you told us. I hope it didn't put you off your game, said Millicent. Really, my dear, I think that is a most improper observation exclaimed her father. He rose from his chair, walked to the empty fireplace, and from Forsyth of habit stood in front of it with parted coattails. It was my business, said Millicent, and if I chose to keep it to myself, I don't see why I shouldn't. It doesn't look as if you had any affection for your mother if you didn't even tell her, said Mrs. Skinner. Millicent shrugged her shoulders. You might have known it was bound to come out, said Kathleen. Why? I didn't expect the two gossiping old parsons would have nothing else to talk about than me. When the bishop said he'd been to Borneo, it's only natural that the Haywood should ask him if he knew about you and if he knew you and Harold. All that's neither here nor there, said Mr. Skinner. I think you should certainly have told us the truth, and we could have decided what was the best thing to do. As a solicitor, I can tell you that in the long run, it only makes things worse if you attempt to hide them. Poor Harold, said Mrs. Skinner, and the tears began to trickle down her rattled cheeks. It seems dreadful. He was always a good son-in-law to me. Whatever induced him to do such a dreadful thing? The climate. I think you'd better give us all the facts, Millicent, said her father. Kathleen will tell you. Kathleen hesitated. What she had to say really was rather dreadful. It seemed terrible that such things should happen to a family like theirs. The bishop says he cut his throat. Mrs. Skinner gasped, and she went impulsively up to her bereaved daughter. She wanted to fold her in her arms. My poor child, she sobbed. But Millicent withdrew herself. Please don't fuss me, mother. I really can't stand being mauled about. Really, Millicent, said Mrs. Skinner with a frown. He did not think she was behaving very nicely. Mrs. Skinner dabbed her eyes carefully with her handkerchief and with a sigh, a little shake of the head, returned to her chair. Kathleen fidgeted with the long chain she wore around her neck. It does seem rather absurd that I should have to be told the details of my brother-in-law's death by a friend. It makes us all look such fools. The bishop wants to, very much to see you, Millicent. He wants to tell you how much he feels for you. She paused, but Millicent did not speak. He said that Millicent had been away with Joan, and when she came back, she found poor Harold lying dead on his bed. It must have been a great shock, said Mr. Skinner. Mrs. Skinner began to cry again, but Kathleen put her hand gently on her shoulder. Don't cry, mother, she said. 
it'll make your eyes red. And people will think it's so funny. They were all silent while Mrs. Skinner, drying her eyes, made a successful effort to control herself. It seemed very strange to her that at this very moment she should be wearing in her toque the ospreys that poor Harold had given her. There's something else I ought to tell you, said Kathleen. Millicent looked at her sister again without haste, and her eyes were steady but watchful. She had the look of a person who is waiting for a sound which she is afraid of missing. I don't want to say anything to wound you, dear, Kathleen went on, but there's something else, and I think you ought to know it. The bishop says that Harold drank. Oh, my dear, how dreadful, cried Mrs. Skinner. What a shocking thing to say. Did Gladys Haywood tell you? What did you say? I said it was entirely untrue. That is what comes of making secrets of things, said Mrs. Skinner irritably. It's always the same. If you try and hush a thing up, all sorts of rumors get about, which are ten times worse than the truth. They told the bishop in Singapore that Harold had killed himself while he was suffering from delirium tremens. I think for all our sakes you ought to deny that, Millicent. It's such a dreadful thing to have said about anyone who's dead, said Mrs. Skinner. And it'll be so bad for Joan when she grows up. But what is the foundation of this story, Millicent? asked her father. Harold was always very abstemious. Here, said the willow, widow. Did he drink? Like a fish. The answer was so unexpected and the tone so sardonic that all three of them were startled. Millicent, how can you talk like that of your husband when he's dead, cried her mother, clasping her neatly gloved hands. I can't understand you. You've been so strange since you came back. I could never have believed that a girl of mine could take her husband's death like that. Never mind about that, mother, said Mr. Skinner. We can go into all that later. He walked to the window and looked out at the sunny little garden and then walked back into the room. He took his pince-nez out of his pocket and though he had no intention of putting them on, wiped them with his handkerchief. Millicent looked at him and in her eyes unmistakably was a look of irony which was quite cynical. Mr. Skinner was vexed he had finished his week's work, and he was a free man till Monday morning. Though he had told his wife that this garden party was a great nuisance, and he would much sooner have tea quietly in his own garden, he had been looking forward to it. He did not care very much about Chinese missions, but it would be interesting to meet the bishop. And now this! It was not the kind of thing he cared to be mixed up in. It was most unpleasant to be told on a sudden that his son-in-law was a drunkard and a suicide. Millicent was thoughtfully smoothing her white gloves. Her coolness irritated him, but instead of interesting her, he spoke to his younger daughter. Why don't you sit down, Kathleen? Surely there are plenty of chairs in the room. Kathleen drew forward a chair and without a word seated herself. Mr. Skinner stopped in front of Millicent and faced her. Of course, I see why you told us Harold had died of fever. I think it was a mistake, because that sort of thing is bound to come out sooner or later. I don't know how far what the bishop has told the Haywoods coincides with the facts, but if you will take my advice, you will tell us everything as circumstantially as you can. Then we can see. We can't hope that it will go no farther now that Canon Haywood and Gladys know. In a place like this, people are bound to talk. It will make it easier for all of us if we, at all events, know the exact truth. Mrs. Skinner and Kathleen thought he put the matter very well.
They waited for Millicent's reply. She had listened with an impassive face. That sudden flush had disappeared, and it was once more, as usual, pasty and sallow. I don't think you'll much like the truth if I tell it you, she said. You must know that you can count on our sympathy and understanding, said Kathleen gravely. Millicent gave her a glance, and the shadow of a smile flickered across her set mouth. She looked slowly at the three of them. Mrs. Skinner had an uneasy impression that she looked at them as though they were mannequins at a dressmaker's. She seemed to live in a different world from theirs and have no connection with them. You know, I wasn't in love with Harold when I married him, she said reflectively. Mrs. Skinner was on the point of making an exclamation when a, ra a rapid gesture on her, of her husband barely indicated, but after so many years of married life, perfectly significant, stopped her. Millicent went on. She spoke with a level voice, slowly, and there was little change of expression in her tone. I was 27, and no one seemed to want to marry me. It's true he was 44, and it seemed rather old, but he had a very good position, hadn't he? I wasn't likely to get a better chance. Mrs. Skinner felt inclined to cry again, but she remembered the party. Of course, I na see now why you took his photograph away, she said dolefully. Don't, mother, exclaimed Kathleen. It had been taken when he was engaged to Millicent and was a very good photograph of Harold. Mrs. Skinner had always thought him quite a fine man. He was heavily built, tall, and perhaps a little too fat. But he held himself well, and his presence was imposing. He was inclined to be bald, even then, but men did go bald very early nowadays, and he said that topis, sun, ham sun helmets, you know, were very bad for the hair. He had a very small, dark mustache, and his face was deeply burned by the sun. Of course, his best feature was his eyes. They were brown and large, like Jones. His conversation was interesting. Kathleen said he was pompous, but Mrs. Skinner didn't think him so. She didn't mind it if a man laid down the law. And when she saw, as she very soon did, that he was attracted by Millicent, she began to like him very much. He was always very attentive to Mrs. Skinner and she listened as though she were really interested when she spoke of his district and told her the big game he had killed. Kathleen said he had a pretty good opinion of himself, but Mrs. Skinner came of a generation which accepted, which accepted without question the good opinion that men had of themselves. Millicent saw very soon which way the wind blew, and though she said nothing to her mother, her mother knew that if Harold asked her, she was going to accept him. Harold was staying with some people who had been 30 years in Borneo, and they spoke well of the country. There was no reason why a woman shouldn't live there comfortably. Of course, the children had to come home when they were seven. But Mrs. Skinner thought it unnecessary to trouble about that yet. She asked Harold to dine, and she told him they were always in to tea. He seemed to be at a loose end, and when his visit to his old friends was drawing to a close, she told him they would be very much pleased if he would come and spend a fortnight with them. It was toward the end of this that Harold and Millicent became engaged. They had a very pretty wedding. They went to Venice for their honeymoon, and then they started for the east. Millicent wrote from the various ports at which, at which the ship touched. She seemed happy. People were very nice to me at Kuala Salor, she said. Kuala Salor was the chief town of the state of Samburu. We stayed with the resident, and everyone asked us to dinner. 
Once or twice I heard men ask Carol to have a drink, but he refused. He said he had turned over a new leaf. Now he was a married man. I didn't know why they laughed. Mrs. Gray, the resident's wife, told me they were all so glad Harold was married. She said it was dreadfully lonely for a bachelor at one of the outstations. When we left Kuala Salor, Mrs. Gray said, to my, said goodbye to me so funnily that I was quite surprised. It was as if she was solemnly putting Harold in my charge. They listened to her in silence. Kathleen never took her eyes off her sister's impassive face. But Mr. Skinner stared straight in front of him at the melee arms, krises, and parangs, which hung on the wall above the sofa on which his wife sat. It wasn't until I got back to Kuala so long a year and a half later that I found out why their manner had seemed so odd. Millicent gave a queer little sound, like the echo of a scornful laugh. I knew then a good deal that I hadn't known before. Harold came to England that time in order to marry. He didn't much mind who it was. Do you remember how we spread ourselves out to catch him, Mother? We needn't have taken so much trouble. I don't know what you mean, Millicent said Mrs. Skinner, not without acerbity, for the insinuation of scheming did not please her. I saw he was attracted to you. Millicent shrugged her heavy shoulders. He was a confirmed drunkard. He used to go to bed every night with a bottle of whiskey and empty it before morning. The chief secretary told him he'd have to resign unless he stopped drinking. He said he'd give him one more chance. He could take his leave then and go to England. He advised him to marry so that when he got back, he'd have someone to look after him. Harold married me because he wanted a keeper. They took bets in Kuala Salon, Kuala Salon on how long I'd make him stay sober. But he was in love with you, Mrs. Skinner interrupted. You don't know how he used to speak to me about you. And at the time you were speaking of, when you went to Kuala Salor to have Joan, he wrote me such a charming letter about you. Millicent looked at her mother again, and a deep color dyed her sallow skin. Her hands, lying on her lap, began to tremble a little. She thought of those first few, few months of her married life. The government launch took them to the mouth of the river and they spent the night at the bungalow, which Harold said jokingly was their seaside residence. Next day they went upstream, upstream in a prow. From the novel she had read, she expected the rivers of Borneo to be dark and strangely sinister, but the sky was blue, dappled with little white clouds and the green of the mangroves and the nipas washed by the flowing water, glistened in the sun. On each side stretched the pathless jungle, and in the distance, silhouetted against the sky, was the ragged outline of a mountain. The air in the early morning was fresh and buoyant. She seemed to enter upon a friendly, fertile land, and she had a sense of spacious freedom. They watched the bank for monkeys sitting on the branches of the tangled trees, and once Harold pointed out something that looked like a log and said it was a crocodile. The assistant residence, resident in ducks and a topi was at the landing stage to meet them and a dozen trim little soldiers were lined up to do them honor. The assistant resident was introduced to her. His name was Simpson. By Jove, sir, he said to Harold, I'm glad to see you back. It's been deuced lonely without you. The resident's bungalow, surrounded by a garden in which grew wildly all manner of gay flowers, stood on the top of a low hill. It was a tribal shabby, and the furniture was sparse, but the rooms were cool and of generous size. The compound is down there, said Harold. 
pointing. Her eyes followed his gesture. And from among the coconut trees rose the beating of a gong. It gave her a queer little sensation in the heart. Though she had not, nothing much to do, the days passed easily enough. At dawn, a boy brought them their tea, and they lounged about the veranda, enjoying the fragrance of the morning. Harold in a singlet and Jerome, she in a dressing gown, till it was time to dress for breakfast. Then Harold went to his office, and she spent an hour or two learning melee. After Tiffin, he went back to his office while she slept. A cup of tea revived them both, and they went for a walk or played golf on the nine old links which Harold had made on a level piece of clear jungle below the bungalow. Night fell at six, and Mr. Simpson came along to have a drink. They chatted till their late dinner hour, and sometimes Harold and Mr. Simpson played chess. The balmy evenings were enchanting. The fireflies turned the bushes just below the veranda into coldly sparkling, tremulous beacons, and flowering trees scented the air with sweet odors. After dinner, they read the papers, which had left London six weeks before, and presently went to bed. Millicent enjoyed being a married woman with a house of her own, and she was pleased with the native servants and their gay sarongs who went about the bungalow with bare feet, silent but friendly. It gave her a pleasant sense of importance to be the wife of the resident. Harold impressed her by the fluency with which he spoke the language, by his air of command and by his dignity. She went into the courthouse now and then to hear him try cases. The multifariousness of his duties and the competent way in which he performed them aroused her respect. Mr. Simpson told her that Harold understood the natives as well as any man in the country. He had the combination of firmness, tact, and good humor, which were essential in dealing with that timid, reven revengeful, and suspicious race. Millicent began to feel a certain admiration for her husband. They had been married nearly a year when two English naturalists came to stay with them for a few days on their way to the interior. They brought a pressing recommendation from the governor, and Harold said he wanted to do them proud. Their arrival was an agreeable change. Millicent asked Mr. Simpson to dinner. He lived at the fort and only dined with him on Sunday nights. And after dinner, the men sat down to play bridge. Millicent left them presently and went to bed. But they were so noisy, noisy that for some time she could not get to sleep. She did not know at what hour she was awakened by Harold staggering into the room. She kept silent. He made up his mind to have a bath before getting into bed. The bathhouse was just below their room and he went down the steps that led to it. Apparently he slipped, for there was a great clatter and he began to swear. Then he was violently sick. She heard him sluice the buckets of water over himself and in a little while, walking very cautiously this time, he crawled up the stairs and slipped into bed. Millicent pretended to be asleep. She was disgusted. Harold was drunk. She made up her mind to speak about it in the morning. What would the naturalist think of him? But in the morning, Harold was so dignified that she hadn't quite the determination to refer to the matter. At eight, Harold and she, with their two guests, sat down to breakfast. Harold looked round the table. Porridge, he said. Millicent, your guests might manage a little Worcester sauce for breakfast, but I don't think they'll much fancy anything else. Personally, I shall content myself with a whiskey and soda. The naturalist laughed, but shamefacedly. Your husband's a terror, said one of them. I should not think I had properly performed the duties of hospitality. 
If I sent you sober to bed on the first night of your visit, said Harold, with his round, stately way of putting things. Millicent, smiling acidly, was relieved to think that her guests had been as drunk as her husband. The next evening she sat up with them, and the party broke up at a reasonable hour. But she was glad when the strangers went on their journey. Their life resumed its placid course. Some months later, Harold went on a tour of inspection of his district and came back with a bad attack of malaria. This was the first time she had seen the disease of which she had heard so much, and when it re he recovered, it did not seem strange to her that Harold was very shaky. She found his manner peculiar. He would come back from the office and stare at her with glazed eyes. He would stand on the veranda, swaying slightly, but still dignified, and make long harangues about the political situation in England. Losing the thread of his discourse, he would look at her with an archness, which his natural stateliness made somewhat disconcerting, and say, push you down dreadfully, this confounded malaria. Ah, oh, little woman, you little know the strain it puts upon a man to be an empire builder. She thought that Mr. Simpson began to look worried. And once or twice when they were alone, he seemed on the point of saying something to her, which his shyness at the last moment prevented. The feeling grew so strong that it made her nervous, and one evening when Harold, she knew not why, had remained later than usual at the office, she tackled him. What have you got to say to me, Mr. Simpson? She broke out suddenly. He blushed and hesitated. Nothing? What makes you think I have anything in particular to say to you? Mr. Simpson was a thin, weedy youth of four and twenty, with a fine head of waving hair, which he took, he took great pains to plaster down very flat. His wrists were swollen and scarred with mosquito bites. Millicent looked at him steadily. If it's something to do with Harold, don't you think it would be kinder to tell me frankly? He grew scarlet now. He shuffled uneasily on his rattan chair. She insisted. I'm afraid you'll think it awful cheek, he said at last. It's rotten of me to say anything about my chief behind his back. Malaria's a rotten thing, and after one's had a bout of it, one feels awfully down and out. He hesitated again. The corners of his mouth sagged as if he were going to cry. To Millicent, he seemed like a little boy. I'll be as silent as the grave, she said with a smile, trying to conceal her apprehension. Do tell me. I think it's a pity your husband keeps a bottle of whiskey at the office. He's apt to take a nip more often than he otherwise would. Mr. Simpson's voice was hoarse with agitation. Millicent felt a sudden coldness shiver through her. She controlled herself, for she knew that she must not frighten the boy if she were to get out of him all there was to tell. He was unwilling to speak. She pressed him, wheedling, appealing to his sense of duty, and at last she began to cry. Then he told her that Harold had been drunk, more or less, for the last fortnight. The natives were talking about it, and they said that soon he would be as bad as he had been before his marriage. He had been in the habit of drinking a good deal too much then, but details of that time, notwithstanding all her attempts, Mr. Simpson resolutely declined to give her. Do you think he's drinking now? she asked. I don't know. Millicent felt herself of a sudden hot with shame and anger. The fort, as it was called because the rifles and the ammunition were kept there, was also the courthouse. It stood opposite the residence bungalow in a garden of its own. The sun was just about to set and she did not need a hat. She got up and walked across. <laughs> 
She found Harold sitting in the office behind the large hall in which he administered justice. There was a bottle of whiskey in front of him. He was smoking cigarettes and talking to three or four Malays who stood in front of him, listening with obsequious and at the same time scornful smiles. His face was red. The natives vanished. I came to see what you were doing, she said. He rose, for he always treated her with elaborate politeness, and lurched. Feeling himself unsteady, he assumed an elaborate stateliness of demeanor. Take a seat, my dear, take a seat. I was detained by press of work. She looked at him with angry eyes. You're drunk, she said. He stared at her, his eyes bulging a little and a haughty look, look gradually transversed his large and fleshy face. I haven't the remotest idea of what you mean, he said. She had been ready with a flow of wrathful expostulation, but suddenly she burst into tears. She sank into a chair and hid her face. Harold looked at her for an instant then the tears began to trickle down his cheeks. He came towards her with outstretched arms and fell heavily on his knees. Sobbing, he clasped her to him. Forgive me, forgive me, he said. I promise you it shall not happen again. It's that damned malaria. It's so humiliating, she moaned. He wept like a child. There was something very touching in the self-abasement of that big, dignified man. Presently, Millicent looked up. His eyes, appealing and contrite, sought hers. Will you give me your word of honor that you will never touch liquor again? Yes, yes, I hate it. It was then she told him that she was with child. He was overjoyed. That is the one thing I wanted. That will keep me straight. They went back to the bungalow. Harold bathed himself and had a nap. After dinner, they talked long and quietly. He admitted that before he married her, he had occasionally drunk more than was good for him. In outstations, it was easy to fall into bad habits. He agreed to everything that Millicent asked. And during the months before it was necessary, necessary for her to go to Kuala Salor, for her to go to Kuala Salor for her confinement, Harold was an excellent husband, tender, thoughtful, proud, and affectionate. He was irreproachable. A launch came to fetch her. She was to leave him for six weeks, and he promised faithfully to drink nothing during her absence. He put his hands on her shoulders. I never break a promise, he said in his dignified way. But even without it, can you imagine that while you are going through so much, I should do anything to increase your troubles? Joan was born. Millicent stayed at the residence and Mrs. Gray, his wife, a kindly creature of middle age, was very good to her. The two women had little to do the, during the long hours they were alone, but to talk. And in course of time, Millicent learned everything there was to know of her husband's alcoholic past. The fact which she found most difficult to reconcile herself to was that Harold had been told that the only condition upon which he would be allowed to keep his post was that he should bring back a wife. It caused in her a dull feeling of resentment. And when she discovered what a persistent drunkard he had been, she felt vaguely uneasy. She had a horrid fear that during her absence, he would not have been able to resist the craving. She went home with her baby and a nurse. She spent a night at the mouth of the river and sent a messenger in a canoe to announce her arrival. She scanned the landing stage anxiously as the launch approached it. Harold and Mr. Simpson were standing there. 
The trim little soldiers were lined up. Her heart sank, for Harold was swaying slightly, like a man who seeks to keep his, keep his balance on a rolling ship. And she knew he was drunk. It wasn't a very pleasant homecoming. She had almost forgotten her mother and father and her sister, who sat there silently listening to her. Now she roused herself and became once more aware of their presence. All that she spoke of seemed very far away. I knew that I hated him then, she said. I could have killed him. Oh, Millicent, don't say that, cried her mother. Don't forget that he's dead, poor man. Millicent looked at her mother, and for a moment a scowl darkened her impassive face. Mr. Skinner moved uneasily. Go on, said Kathleen. When he found out that I knew all about him, he didn't bother very much more. In three months he had another attack of DP DTs. Why didn't you leave him, said Kathleen. What would have been the good of that? He would have been dismissed from the service in a fortnight. Who was to keep me and Joan? I had to stay. And when he was sober, I had nothing to complain of. He wasn't in the least in love with me, but he was fond of me. I hadn't married him because I was in love with him, but because I wanted to be married. I did everything I could to keep liquor from him. I managed to get Mr. Gray to prevent whiskey being sent from Kuala Saror, but he got it from the Chinese. I watched him as a cat watches a mouse. He was too cunning for me. In a little while, he had another outbreak. He neglected his duties from Kuala Saror, and that was our safeguard. But I suppose something was said, for Mr. Gray wrote a private letter of warning to me. I showed it to Harold. He stormed and blustered, but I saw he was frightened. And for two or three months, he was quite sober. Then it began again. And so it went on till our leave became due. Before we came to stay here, I begged and prayed him to be careful. I didn't want any of you to know what sort of a man I had married. All the time he was in England, he was all right. And before we sailed, I warned him. He had grown to be very fond of Joan and very proud of her, and she was devoted to him. She always liked him better than she liked me. I asked him if he wanted to have his child grow up, knowing that he was a drunkard. And I found out that at last I'd got a hold on him. The thought terrified him. I told him that I wouldn't allow it, and if he ever let Joan see him drunk, I'd take her away from him at once. Do you know he grew quite pale when I said it? I fell on my knees that night and thanked God because at last I had found a way of saving my husband. He told me that if I would stand by him, he would have another try. We made up our minds to fight the thing together, and he tried so hard. When he felt as though he must drink, he came to me. You know he was inclined to be rather pompous. With me, he was so humble. He was like a child. He depended on me. Perhaps he didn't love me when he married me, but he loved me then, me and Joan. I'd hated him because of the humiliation, because when he was drunk and tried to be dignified and impressive, he was loathsome. But now I got a strange feeling in my heart. It wasn't love, but it was a queer, shy tenderness. He was something more than my husband. He was like a child that I'd carried under my heart for long and weary months. He was so proud of me. And you know, I was proud too. His long speeches didn't irritate me anymore and I only thought his stately ways rather funny and charming. At last we won. For two years, he never touched a drop. 
he had lost his craving entirely. He was even able to joke about it. Mr. Simpson had left us then, and we had another young man called Francis. I'm a reformed, dr I'm reformed drunken, you know. <laughs> I'm a reformed drunkard, you know, Francis, Harold said to him once. If it hadn't been for my wife, I'd have been sacked long ago. I've got the best wife in the world, Francis. You don't know what it meant to me to hear him say that. I felt that all I'd gone through was worthwhile. While I was so happy. She was silent. She thought of the broad, yellow, and turgid river on whose banks she had lived so long. The egrets, white and gleaming in the tremulous sunset, flew down the stream in a flock, flew low and swift and scattered. They were like a ripple of snowy notes, sweet and pure and spring light like which an unseen hand drew forth a divine, arche arpe a divine arpeggio from an unseen harp. They fluttered along between the green banks, wrapped in the shadows of evening, like the happy thoughts of a contented mind. Then Joan fell ill. For three weeks we were very anxious. There was no doctor nearer than Kuala Salor, and we had to put up with the treatment of a native dispenser. When she grew well again, I took her down to the mouth of the river in order to give her a breath of sea air. We stayed there a week. It was the first time I had been separated from Harold since I went away to have Joan. There was a fishing village on piles not far from us, but really we were quite alone. I thought a great deal about Harold, so tenderly, and all at once I knew that I loved him. I was so glad when the Prow came to fetch us back because I wanted to tell him. I thought it would mean a great deal to him. I can't tell you how happy I was. As we rolled upstream, the headman told me that Mr. Francis had had to go up country to arrest a woman who had murdered her husband. He had been gone a couple of days. I was surprised that Harold was not on the landing stage to meet me. He was always very punctilious about that sort of thing. He used to say that husband and wife should treat one another as politely as they treated acquaintances. And I could not imagine what business had prevented him. I walked up the little hill on which the bungalow stood. The ayah brought Joan behind me. The bungalow was strangely silent. There seemed to be no servants about, and I could not make it out. I wondered if Harold hadn't expected me so soon and was out. I went up the steps. Joan was thirsty, and the ayah took her to the servants' quarters to give her something to drink. Harold was not in the sitting room. I called him, but there was no answer. I was disappointed because I should have liked him to be there. I went into our bedroom. Harold wasn't out, after all. He was lying on the bed asleep. I was really very much amused because he always pretended he never slept in the afternoon. He said it was an, an, an unnecessary habit that we white people got into. I went up to the bed softly. I thought I would have a joke with him. I opened the mosquito curtains. He was lying on his back with nothing on but a sarong. And there was an empty whiskey bottle by his side. He was drunk. It had begun again. All my struggles for so many years were wasted. My dream was shattered. It was all hopeless. I was seized with rage. Millicent's face grew once again darkly red, and she clutched the arms of the chair she sat in. I took him by the shoulders and shook him with all my might. You beast, I cried, you beast. I was so angry, I didn't know what I did. I don't know what I said. I kept on shaking him. You don't know how loathsome he looked, that large, fat man, half naked, 
He hadn't shaved for days, and his face was bloated and purple. He was breathing heavily. I shouted at him, but he took no notice. I tried to drag him out of bed, but he was too heavy. He lay there like a log. Open your eyes, I screamed. I shook him again. I hated him. I hated him all the more because for a week I'd loved him with all my heart. He'd let me down. He'd let me down. I wanted to tell him what a filthy beast he was. I could make no impression on him. You shall open your eyes, I cried. I was determined to make him look at me. The widow licked her dry lips. Her breath seemed hurried. She was silent. If he was in that state, I should have thought it best to let him go on sleeping, said Kathleen. There was a prong on the wall by the side of the bed. You know how fond Harold was of curios. What's a parong, said Mrs. Skinner. Don't be silly, mother, her husband replied irritably. There's one on the wall immediately behind you. He pointed to the melee sword on which, for some reason, his eyes had been unconsciously resting. Mrs. Skinner drew quickly into the corner of the sofa with a little frightened gesture, as though she had been told that a snake lay curled up beside her. Suddenly the blood spurted out from Harold's throat. There was a great red gash right across it. Millicent, cried Kathleen, springing up and almost leaping towards her. What in God's name do you mean? Mrs. Skinner stood staring at her with wide, startled eyes, her mouth open. The Puran wasn't on the wall anymore. It was on the bed. Then Harold opened his eyes. They were just like Jones. I don't understand, said Mr. Skinner. How could he have committed suicide if he was in that state you describe? Kathleen took her sister's arm and shook her angrily. Millicent, for God's sake, explain. Millicent released herself. The parang was on the wall. I told you. I don't know what happened. There was all the blood, and Harold opened his eyes. He died almost at once. He never spoke, but he gave a sort of gasp. At last, Mr. Skinner found his voice. But you wretched woman, it was murder. Millicent, her face mottled with red, gave him such a look of scornful hatred that he shrank back. Mrs. Skinner cried out, Millicent, you didn't do it, did you? Then Millicent did something that made them all feel as though their blood were turned to ice in their veins. She chuckled. I don't know who else did, she said. My God, muttered Mr. Skinner. Kathleen had been standing bolt upright with her hands to her heart as though its beating were intolerable. And what happened then, she said. I screamed. I went to the window and flung it open. I called for the ayah. She came across the compound with Joan. Not Joan, I cried. Don't let her come. She called the cook and told him to take the child. I cried to her to hurry, and when she came, I showed her, I showed her Harold. The twans killed himself, I cried. She gave a scream and ran out of the house. No one would come near. They were all frightened out of their wits. I wrote a letter to Mr. Francis telling him what had happened and asked him, asking him to come at once. How do you mean you told him what had happened? I said on my return from the mouth of the river, I'd found Harold with his throat cut. You know, in the tropics, you have to bury people quickly. I got a Chinese coffin and the soldiers dug a grave behind the fort. When Mr. Francis came, Harold had been buried for nearly two days. He was only a boy. I could do anything I wanted with him. I told him I'd found the prong in Harold's hand, and there was no doubt he'd killed himself in an attack of delirium tremens. I showed him the empty bottle. The servant said he'd been drinking hard ever since I left to go to the sea. I told the same story at Kuala Saroa. Everyone was very kind to me, and the government granted me a pension.
for a little while nobody spoke. At last, Mr. Skinner gathered himself together. I am a member of the legal profession. I'm a solicitor. I have certain duties. We've always had a most respectable practice. You've put me in a monstrous position. He fumbled, searching for the phrases that played at hide and seek in his scattered wits. Millicent looked at him with scorn. What are you going to do about it? It was murder, that's what it was. Do you think I can possibly connive at it? Don't talk nonsense, father, said Kathleen sharply. You can't give your own daughter up. You've put me in a monstrous position, he repeated. Millicent shrugged her shoulders again. You made me tell you, and I've borne it long enough by myself. It was time that all of you should bore it too. At that moment, the door was open, opened by the maid. Davis has brought the car around, sir, she said. Kathleen had the presence of mind to say something, and the maid withdrew. We'd better be starting, said Millicent. I can't go to the party now, cried Mrs. Skinner with horror. I'm far too upset. How can we face the Haywoods? And the bishop will want to be introduced to you. Millicent made a gesture of indifference. Her eyes held their ironical expression. We must go, mother, said Kathleen. It would look so funny if we stayed away. She turned on Millicent furiously. Oh, I think the whole thing is such frightfully bad form. Mrs. Skinner looked helplessly at her husband. He went to her and gave her his hand to help her up from the sofa. I'm afraid we must go, mother, he said. And me with the ospreys in my toque that Harold gave me with his own hands, she moaned. He led her out of the room. Kathleen followed close on their heels, and a step or two behind came Millicent. You'll get used to it, you know, she said quietly. At first, I thought of it all the time. But now I forget it for two or three days together. It's not as if there was any danger. They did not answer. They walked through the hall and out of the front door. The three ladies got into the back of the car and Mr. Skinner seated himself beside the driver. They had no self-starter, it was an old car, and Davis went to the bonnet to crank it up. Mr. Skinner turned round and looked petulantly at Millicent. I ought never to have been told, he said. I think it was most selfish of you. Davis took his seat and they drove off to the canon's garden party. And that is Somerset Morns before the party. I hope you've enjoyed it, my dears. I find his writing just extraordinary. His characters are so vivid, so real, and his sense of time and place is impeccable. Anyway, that's it for Tales and Cocktails tonight, and I hope you'll join me next Wednesday at six. Thank you very much. Bye now.